Good morning, everybody. This is Mrs. Fever, and I am going to go ahead and start your diabetes lecture. I'm, I'm going to split it up into two parts. So today we'll be talking about what diabetes is and some of the complications that can go along with that. The pathophysiology here is um, diabetes is a chronic disorder of impaired metabolism with vascular and neurologic complications. The key feature here is elevated blood glucose called hyperglycemia. Blood glucose levels normally are regulated by insulin, a hormone produced by beta cells in the islets of Langerhans located in our pancreas. The patients here with hyperglycemia are going to be at an increased risk for heart disease, kidney disease, blindness, amputations, and complications during pregnancy as well. But not um, now with better management options, it's possible to reduce those risks. So in healthy individuals, a small amount of insulin is actually secreted continuously. That's called a basal secretion. It's where insulin is moved into the bloodstream um, just at a continuous motion. The ingestion of carbohydrates And this is just a picture of what your um, pancreas looks like and the arteries of the pancreas and the spleen. Our, our pancreas is a long, slender organ that lies transversely across our upper abdomen, extending from the curve of the duodenum to the spleen. It's six to eight inches long in adults. It has two functions. They're endocrine and exocrine functions. So they aid in digestion. Um, they produce digestive enzymes. And then they have a hormonal function that secretes two hormones to regulate our blood glucose levels, and that is insulin and glucagon. So in the pancreas, we have the islets of Langerhans. These are hormone producing cells of the pancreas. They constitute one to 2% of the mass of the pancreas. And each islet contains a few thousand cells and is 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 millimeters in diameter. The alpha cells here produce glucagon, which converts glycogen to glucose. That raises our blood sugar level. And then the beta cells produce the insulin, which causes glucose to move into the cells from the bloodstream to then lower the blood sugar levels. And then we have delta cells, which sec secrete somostatin and gastrin.
So the roles of our insulin, the first role is for glucose. Insulin here is considered a critical hormone for glucose metabolism. It stimulates active transport of glucose into the cells. So if insulin is absent, glucose remains in the bloodstream and then it becomes thick, which increases its osmolality. And then the increased osmolality here stimulates the thirst center. And then increased fluid does not pass into the body tissue. So we have a high serum osmolality, which retains fluid in the bloodstream. And then as blood passes through the kidneys, some glucose is eliminated, which we know that glucose should not be eliminated into our urine. So the osmotic force created by glucose draws extra fluid and electrolytes with it, causing abnormally increased urine volume. Another role of insulin um, is a fatty acids. Um, insulin in, fatty, in the role of fatty acids promotes fatty acid synthesis and conversion of fatty acids into fat which is stored as adipose tissue. It also spares fat by inhibiting breakdown of adipose tissue and mo mobilization of fat and by inhibiting the conversion of fats to glucose. Without adequate insulin, fat stores break down and increase triglycerides that are stored in the liver. Increased fatty acids in the liver can triple the production then of lipoproteins, which promotes atherosclerosis so this is why people with diabetes have a high incidence of cardiovascular diseases. And then the role of insulin in protein. This enhances protein synthesis in tissues and inhibits the conversion of protein into glucose. Amino acids are admitted into cells an enhanced rate of protein formation while preventing protein degradation. Without adequate insulin, protein storage halts, large amounts of amino acids are dumped into the bloodstream, then high levels of plasma amino acids place people with diabetes at risk for a development of gout. And changes in protein metabolism lead to extreme weakness and poor organ functioning. So let's talk a little bit about diabetes. Diabetes is a major health problem and a leading cause of death um, by this disease. So according to the American Diabetes Association, 29.1 million Americans have diabetes. This is 9.3% of the population. 8.1 million of them are undiagnosed and 21 million are diagnosed. Another 86 million people in the U.S. have what they call pre-diabetes. So diabetes is a leading cause of death 
In 2010, diabetes was listed as the underlying cause of over 69,000 death certificates and was listed as a contributing factor on an additional 235,000 plus death certificates. Diabetes may be underreported as a cause of death. Studies have found that only 35 to 40% of people with diabetes who died have diabetes listed anywhere on their death certificates. It's a serious chronic disease. Diabetes is the leading cause of new cases of blindness along adults age 20 to 74. It's the leading cause of kidney failure, accounting for 44% of new cases in 2011. And more than 60% of non-traumatic lower limb amputations occur in people with diabetes. This is characterized by insufficient A diagnosis here for diabetes is made on one or more of the following criteria on two separate occasions. Fasting blood glucoses greater than 126, a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5%. That's a three month average. Um, that's a test that does that test for a three month average of your blood glucose levels a two hour oral glucose tolerance test, otherwise known as the GTT, greater than 200, and a random glucose of greater than 200 with symptoms of polydipsia, polyphagia, and polyuria. Those are your three classic symptoms of diabetes. We want our normal blood glucose level ranges to be 70 to 100. So pre-diabetes, these are individuals with impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance or both. These are risk factors for developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So we wanna educate these patients regarding weight reduction and increased physical activity if that fits what they need, what they need in their education to reduce those levels. Typically, you will see that those patients are um, obese and they're really inactive. And then the diagnostic criteria here for prediabetes is a fasting plasma glucose of 100 to 125 or a two hour plasma glucose of 140 to 199, or a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 to 6.4. And just a little comedy here. So let's talk about type 1 um, and type 2. So type 1 diabetes, this um, constitute only 10% of our diabetics. It's formally known as insulin-dependent diabetes or juvenile, juvenile onset diabetes. And type 2 diabetes actually constitute 90% of our diabetics. It's formally known as non-insulin-dependent diabetes or adult onset diabetes. So type 1 diabetes, this is an autoimmune trigger destruction of the pancreatic beta cells. 
our insulin levels here are reduced and continue to decline to zero. So insulin here is the key to actually unlock those cells. In diabetics, these beta cells are either attacked or destroyed in diabetes 1 are, or are unable to produce sufficient, sufficient amounts of insulin needed for blood sugar control. That would be um, diabetes type 2. So there's the difference there. So in diabetes type 1, glucose cannot move into the cells without insulin, therefore it stays in the bloodstream. The result here is our elevated serum glucose. The increased glucose causes osmotic diuresis, dehydration. So insulin is needed for glucose to get inside the cell so that it may be used to make energy. So it's that key that we need. Um, to use glucose properly. And without it, then um, we have big problems. So type 1 diabetes, the age of onset here is usually in childhood. Onset is typically abrupt. Our etiology here, um, there could be a genetic susceptibility or environmental um, examples like viruses, autoimmune then, immuno, immunologically mediated destruction of our beta cells, which are our insulin producing cells, or the removal of the pancreas. Our clinical manifestations for type 1 diabetes, they're going to be that polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, weight loss, our elevated fasting blood glucoses, frequent infections, a tendency then to develop ketosis, and slow wound healing. So slow wound healing is going to occur because our elevated blood sugar levels stiffen the arteries and cause narrowing of the blood vessels. So narrowed blood vessels here lead to decreased blood flow and oxygen to a wound. So an elevated blood sugar level decreases the function of red blood cells that carry nutrients to the tissue. This lowers the efficiency of the white blood cells that fight infection. So without sufficient nutrients and oxygen, a wound really will heal slowly. So for type 1 diabetic patients, insulin replacement is mandatory. They actually can't live without it because their body doesn't make it or makes very, very little. Um, oral hypoglycemics here are not effective. Our treatment is going to be subcutaneous insulin, strict dietary control, regular and routine exercise, um, diabetic education here is a must. A lot of your newly diagnosed patients will meet with a diabetic educator probably for a day or two, if not a few, and then maybe even do some follow-up appointments with um, an educator or nutritionist um, after they're released from the hospital as, as well. And then they do frequent self-monitoring of blood glucose levels as well. So they're going to need education regarding um, diet, exercise, um, blood glucose. So diabetes mellitus type 1, our signs and symptoms are going to be polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia, weight loss, 
fatigue, and increased frequency of infections. This is a rapid onset with diabetes type 1. They are insulin dependent, and it's an early onset too, um, typically before 15 years of age is what we see with that. So let's move on to um, type 2 diabetes. This is our most prevalent form of diabetes. Remember about 90% of our diabetic patients actually are type 2. The incidence is greatly rising. There's a large number of new cases in adolescents and young adults even, um, approximately 21 million Americans. These patients do not develop ketosis in the hyperglycemic state because they are capable of insulin synthesis. So this is not to say that they can't develop ketosis because anybody can, but it would probably be from something unrelated. It would be from something unrelated to the diabetes type 2 because ketosis is a normal metabolic process. So when the body does not have enough glucose for energy, it burns fat instead. This result is the buildup of acids called ketones within the body. So, okay, so the etiology for type 2 diabetes is um, insulin resistance and impaired insulin secretion. Um, it can be hereditary. Our main factor here is obesity. These patients have a decreased insulin production or faulty insulin receptors or they could be on long-term steroid use um, and that could cause them to have um, type 2 diabetes as well. They may make some insulin, but it's in decreased amounts. Type 2 diabetes most often occurs later in life and it is caused by an acquired resistance to the action of insulin or its receptors. So the term insulin dependent has nothing to do with whether a client uses insulin as a medication, but whether the client makes their own insulin. So type 2 patients make insulin, but their body does not use insulin properly. That's actually called, or use insulin properly, sorry. That's actually called insulin resistance. So risk factors here for diabetes type 2, family history, sedentary lifestyle, obesity, our onset is usually over the age of 40, hypertension, um, pregnancy um, with gestational diabetes, and delivery of a baby greater than 10 pounds. Are Hispanics, Natives, um, Asian and African Americans, as well as persons of Pacific Island descent are at increased risk? And women with polycystic ovarian syndrome um, during those reproductive years are seven times um, or have a seven times greater risk. Insulin levels may be low, deficient or normal or high where they have a resistance. And then metabolic syndrome can actually be a risk factor too. So metabolic syndrome, otherwise known as prediabetes, this is thought to be a precursor to diabetes. It's characterized by impaired glucose tolerance, 
high serum insulin, um, hypertension, elevated triglycerides, and a low HDL cholesterol, an alter size and density of our LDL cholesterol. It's believed that metabolic syndrome is a chronic low-grade inflammatory process affecting endothelial tissue. The long-term effects are atherosclerosis, ischemic heart disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, and type 2 diabetes. Research is directed at learning how to detect this syndrome early and what interventions might slow or arrest the process. So clinical manifestations of type 2 um, diabetes, um, these patients may actually be asymptomatic for several years because it's a more gradual onset process, but you're still going to eventually see then that polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia. It just won't be as quick approaching as it is with type 1 diabetes. And then, of course, they have an elevated fasting blood glucose levels. They may show frequent infections and slow wound healing and visual changes as well. And remember our normal glucose, um, we want these patients, our, our normal glucose is 70 to 100. So treatment for type 2 diabetes is going to be um, diet and exercise. Those alone may be sufficient to control type 2 diabetes. They could eventually need insulin depending on how well their, their control with their diet and exercise is. We're going to want these patients to monitor their blood sugars regularly as well. Now, depending on um, how good their control is and what their physicians order, they may um, only need a blood glucose check once or twice a day versus that of an insulin-dependent um, diabetic who may need blood sugars, you know, four and five times a day. And oral medications, if diet and exercise alone, um, can't control the type 2 diabetes, then a lot of times they'll start with just oral medications, your oral hyperglycemics. And um, if that doesn't control them, then they'll go to insulin after that. Okay, complications of diabetes. Acute complications of diabetes is hypoglycemia. Um, this is an insulin shock or an insulin reaction characterized by a blood sugar below 60. Our causes here are either going to be too much insulin, um, too much exercise, not enough food, or maybe they've been sick, they've had vomiting and diarrhea. Um, consumption of maybe even too much alcohol, or childbirth can do this as well. Okay, diabetics and their 
Diabetic patients and their families should be familiar with the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. So at the um, CVS level, the adrenergic level here, you're first going to see patients with tachycardia, palpitations, diaphoresis, irritability, and restlessness. Those may be some of those very first signs that, that they're going to notice. Um, or you as a nurse, if they're unable to vocalize that to you, may notice some of those signs as well. And then your central nervous system, the neuroglucopenogenic um, state, they're going to see, you're going to see confusion, lethargy. They may be slurring their speech. Um, they could even go into a seizure or even a, a coma. So patients here could exhibit just one or so treatment here for hypoglycemia, um, rapid treatment is mandatory. So if hypoglycemia persists, irreversible brain damage or death can occur. They need instant glucose. So we're either going to have to give that um, by the, the buccal um, route or IV if they're unconscious. If they are conscious, though, we can do a fast-acting oral sugar like glucose tablets, orange juice, um, sugar cubes, honey, corn syrup, a non-sugar-free soda, or eight ounces of skim milk or six to eight lifesavers. And then we can follow that up with carbohydrates and protein like peanut butter and crackers or cheese. Um, a lot of times in the hospital settings, they'll use um, graham crackers and peanut butter. So if they're unconscious or So how do we know if our patients need snacks or could um, have hypoglycemia? There's a saying that says that they're cold and clammy, they need some candy. Okay, so acute complications of diabetes, um, also that di diabetic ketoacidosis like we talked about a little bit ago, this is caused by an ineffective amount of insulin or an absolute deficiency of insulin, um, hyperglycemia, and then there's a production of keto acids, hemoconcentration, acidosis, and coma can even um, occur in patients in um, DKA. This is seen in our type 1 diabetics. The glucose is unable to enter the cell due to lack of insulin, so the cells are starving, and then the body initiates gluconeogenesis by breaking down proteins and fats, which is actually an abnormal metabolism. This is a life-threatening emergency. When the breakdowns of fats and proteins, that body, the body produces this is a mechanism of diabetic ketoacidosis. So keto, diabetic ketoacidosis, so this abnormal metabolism 
um, equals a production of ketones, which are acids. The excessive acid leads to metabolic acidosis. Excessive acid is caused by ketones, and that's called ketoacidosis. Precipitating factors here are infection, trauma, surgery, um, MIs, or an interruption in insulin administration can um, also make one go into a diabetic ketoacidosis. So our etiology here could be an increased intake. Maybe these patients have um, taken in a super, super, super heavy meal and don't have enough insulin to cover that. Or it could be stress linked to things like surgery or just emotional. And it could be related to infection as well. The prevention here um, is going to be tight blood sugar control. Clinical manifestations of um, DKA are going to be weakness, drowsiness, lethargy, hypothermia, and tachycardia. Our blood sugars are going to be elevated in that 300 to 800 range. They're going to have a fruity odor of their breath and their urine. They're going to have that large urine output. Glucose and ketones will be present in their urine. And then those Kuzmal's respirations, that's um, hyperventilation to compensate for acidosis. Polydipsia, dehydration, their pH is going to be below 7.3. You're going to have uh, ketone urea, polyuria. This serum bicarb is going to be decreased as well. So we're going to see a level there less than 15. The mortality rate is 2 to 5% and accounts for half of all deaths in diabetes patients. Our treatment here, um, these patients are going to be dehydrated. So they may have a large volume loss related to vomiting, polyuria, and hyperventilation. So um, IV fluid replacement and strict I's and O's. They're going to also have electrolyte imbalances, um, primarily potassium. So initially they'll have hyperkalemia. So we're going to do fluid replacements and of course insulin as well. So these patients will be um, on an insulin drip initially until they get them under control. Later they're going to be at a risk for hypokalemia. So we're going to um, do a replacement potassium will be initiated only after our adequate urine output is established. So, and then um, acidosis, these ketones accumulated as a result of the breakdown of fat for energy. So we're going to do a slow IV infusion of insulin. Okay, another acute complication of diabetes is um, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome, otherwise known as HHNS. This occurs commonly in type 2 diabetics um, due to similar causes of DKA in type 1 and especially in the elderly. So patients go into a coma from extremely high blood glucose levels. So these are going to be greater than 600. There's no evidence here, though, of elevated ketones. So the pancreas produces enough insulin to prevent breakdown of fatty acids and formation of ketones, but not enough to prevent the hyperglycemic state. So no ketones are formed and no acidosis results. So persistent hyperglycemia here causes osmotic diuresis, resulting of loss of fluid and electrolytes. So there's Clinical manifestations for HHNS is massive dehydration, decreased level of consciousness, 
Um, they're going to be hypotensive, tachycardic, glycosuria, and polyuria. And again, it's often misdiagnosed as a neurologic problem related to their decreased level of consciousness. So our treatment here for HHNS is going to be fluid replacement, um, an insulin drip. We're going to have to support their vital functions, so their kidney functions, um, their respiratory functions. We need to correct the electrolyte imbalances. And here the mortality rate is higher than that of um, those in diabetic ketoacidosis. Mortality rate for HHNS is as high as 15%. But the treatment is similar to that of DKA. So long-term um, complications, so chronic complications of diabetes, are going to be due to that impaired circulation, so that peripheral vascular disease, and the collection of glucose in cells and capillary membranes um, will decrease the transport of oxygen, nutrients, and waste. And then microangiopathy, those microvascular changes, are going to cause things like retinopathy, neuropathy and nephropathy. So retinopathy in these patients. There's vision with diabetic retinopathy versus what one would see in normal vision. So retinopathy here is a damage of retinal vessels, could lead to blindness along people 25 to 74 years of age. 
Um, diabetes is the leading cause of blindness. They recommend yearly eye exams. Um, those eye exams need to be also by a specialist, so an ophthalmologist would better serve those patients. Um, signs and symptoms that suggest impending eye problems are the presence of spots or floaters in the field of vision. Um, these patients may see cobwebs or have sudden visual changes. Even double vision can be a concern here. Nephropathy, this is a damage to capillaries in the kidneys. The capillaries develop increased permeability and begin to leak um, red blood cells, albumin, protein into the urine, which are things that we, are, we should not be seeing leaking into the urine. It eventually, eventually leads to renal failure. So diabetes is the most common cause of end-stage renal disease in the United States. So then extra glucose in the urine serves as a bacterial media. So we'll see these patients um, be at an increased risk then for UTIs. The reduction of risk here is going to be good glycemic control, control of hypertension. Um, they may need ACE inhibitors or angiotensin II receptor blocker, blockers. Um, hydration is a good reduction of risk. Early screening and detection. And then macrovascular complications. So cardiovascular disease is thickening of a vessel wall and it makes your blood flow sluggish. Um, related to a lot of times the hypertriglycerides and floating fats because of that, the impaired fat metabolism that goes along with diabetes. And individuals with diabetes have a two to four fold increased risk for heart disease and stroke, which accounts for 65% of the deaths of people with diabetes. So these patients with um, cardiovascular disease, you may see them have um, decreased pedal pulses, that claudication, which is that pain in the calf while walking. Um, severe cases can even lead to amputation. And prevention, to prevent these complications, we want to teach our patients. So neuropathic complications, this is related to poor glucose control, um, ischemic lesions of the nerves and chemical changes in peripheral nerve cells. They can be classified as mononeuropathy, polyneuropathy, or atomic neuropathy. About 30% of people with diabetes over the age of 40 have impaired sensation in at least one area of their feet. Um, patients who've had diabetes for over 25 years actually have a 50% chance of experiencing neuropathies. So mononeuropathy affects a single nerve or a group of nerves. It's an inadequate blood, it's inadequate blood supply causes a sharp stabbing pain. This pain can be relieved by walking. And then polyneuropathy involves sensory and autot autonomic nerves. It commonly affects both legs symmetrically. These patients will have tingling, numbness, and burning um, to complete that loss of sensation. They need yearly foot examinations um, to test for sensation loss. And autonomic neuropathy, this affects the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So here our cardiovascular involvement would include um, 
postural hypotension, resting tachycardia, exercise intolerance. If our gastrointestinal system is involved, those patients will have constipation, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, gastric reflux, bloating after meals, gastroparesis, where the stomach dilates and, and loses muscle tone. Um, so the gastric emptying there is going to be delayed. And if our genitourinary system is involved, um, they're going to have an atonic bladder, so they're going to have retention and overflow. That is often referred to as a neurogenic bladder as well. And then they may have sexual problems such as erectile dysfunction in men. Okay, so foot complications are also a chronic complication of diabetes. It's associated with neuropathy, inadequate blood supply, or both. So neurologically, our function is impaired and adequate blood flow. So we have impaired function, but we have an adequate blood flow here. So we're going to be warm and pink in our extremities with good pulses, but we're going to lack normal sensation. So they may not recognize injuries. And neurologic function will have adequate function here but our blood flow is going to be impaired. So our extremities may be cold with weaker absent pulses, and when raised the foot becomes pale, but when lowered it becomes red. So injuries may result here from... So we want to teach our patient about the do's and don'ts of diabetic foot care. Um, they need to visually inspect their feet daily. They need to use warm water and avoid soaking. Um, so they need to test the water before submerging their feet. So that way they don't burn their feet. Um, so they wanna make sure and test it probably with like the wrist, their wrist, that would probably give them the best idea of how hot the water really is because they may not feel that, that heat with their feet. So they don't wanna just put their feet right directly in and it could cause them to have burns. They want to dry their feet thoroughly, especially between their toes. They need to wear cotton socks and change them daily. Use just mild lotions on the tops and the bottoms of their feet, not between their toes. So they wanna use lotions that don't have like alcohols or scents in them. Um, their this is why um, diabetic foot care can be so important. We wanna educate well, um, to hope to reduce the risk of ulcers, infections, or even amputations of our patients. So prevention of long-term complications, we need tight control of blood sugar levels. Um, we want to maintain our blood sugars within normal, normal levels with medications, diet, and exercise. And then blood pressures as well. We need to main blood pressures, a systolic of less than 140 and a diastolic less than 80. And then their lipid goals, um, total cholesterol should be less than 200, LDLs less than 100, HDL um, greater than 50, triglycerides less than 150, and then smoking cessation, and then aspirin and ACE inhibitors for those with increased cardiovascular and renal risks. So nursing care of the diabetic patient.
So of course we're going to ask them um, any signs and symptoms if they've had signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Um, we're going to assess for symptoms of DKA or that HHNS. We're going to ask them about their food and fluid intake over the past three days. And then we want to see any home glucose levels if they're available. If they've been checking at home, we want to see patterns there. And we want to ask them about their um, present medication regimen. Their past health history and family history, do they have any history of diabetes type 1 or type 2? Any heart disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, any renal disease, um, this can increase their risk for diabetes. And their obstetric history as well. Um, were these patients? Do they did they have children? Were they um, did they have just a? And then our nursing diagnosis for these patients: um, ineffective health maintenance, ineffective management of therapeutic regimen, risk for deficient fluid volume, risk for injury, activity intolerance, chronic pain disturbed sensory perception, impaired skin integrity, disturbed thought processes, and ineffective coping. Teach glucose control, signs of hypo and hyperglycemia, and management of their disease. So we're gonna stop this first lecture here. Um, stay tuned for the second lecture of the diabetes. We'll go over um, diabetes management more closely in the second lecture. And as always, if you guys have any questions, feel, feel free to let me know. Okay, I am back. This is part two of your diabetes lecture. We're going to talk about management of a diabetic client. Management is really individualized. It's going to be um, based on glucose levels, their weight, and other disease processes, there is no cure for diabetes. So our treatment here is gonna be really aimed at three goals. Um, we need to regulate blood sugars, avoid those complications that come with diabetes, and minimize any disruptions to their lifestyle. A lot of these um, patients think that having diabetes is just going to disrupt everything because they have to stop to plan meals, they have to plan out exercise um, regimens, they have to read labels, um, they have to check blood sugars, and it really shouldn't be that way. So we need to find a way to make sure that they know that they can live a lifestyle um, to the fullest. We want to... Um, modify a diet plan and exercise program, their medications. And like I said, all treatment is highly individualized here. So they're going to have to have very close follow-up with a physician that can help them um, not only set that regimen, but modify it at any given time with sick days, um, infections, or even if they're going to exercise um, more in a day, they may have to have some diet and medication changes in there as well. So early detection and treatment is going to decrease complications. Our average patient with new onset type 2 diabetes has had it for four to seven years before there's an actual diagnosis. Of patients with type 2 diabetes, 25% are believed to have retinopathy, 9% neuropathy, and 8% nephropathy at the time of their diagnosis because it's um, actually been so delayed and they've had this for four to seven years. So they've already gotten some of those complications that go along with that because they don't even know that they have type 2 diabetes. So Diabetes diagnostic tests, um, we can do random blood glucoses. That is um, glucose is drawn without regard to intake. It's going to show um, increase after meals um, with stress, trauma, or infection. Or if there's a lab drawn below the IV site that's running with D5W, or if patients are on steroids, of course, the side effects are increased blood sugars. Or those with prediabetes may show blood sugars down of 100 to 125, which is, which is a little above the normal of 70 to 100. 
Okay, we can do serum blood sugars. One of them is a fasting. Um, that's fasting for four hours minimum without food. Um, sometimes the physicians like them to be fasting for eight hours for that blood sugar level. Um, normal is going to be less than 100. If it's, pos it's positive for prediabetes, if it's over 100, and it's positive for diabetes, if it's over 126. Postprandial, that's drawn two hours after a meal. At that time, blood sugar levels should be returned to normal. So critical glucose levels here are gonna be greater than 400 or less than 40, and those must be reported to our healthcare providers um, and require immediate intervention. So of course, um, hypoglycemic protocols for those less than 40 and um, greater than 400, those patients are probably gonna be put on an insulin drip. Okay, remember with finger sticks, um, they're very accurate with strict technique and um, controls. Results are used throughout the day to adjust insulin diet and exercise. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the clinical settings now that your patients are on sliding scales um, based on their, their blood sugar results. So it's very important to make sure that we're getting accurate results and we're getting them within a timely manner of giving them that insulin. So if you draw a blood sugar at say six o'clock in the morning um, but the patient's tray doesn't come until like eight o'clock and you have an insulin dose to give them based on their blood sugar of say it was 172 um, but that was two hours ago so by this time an hour has passed and you're going to want to recheck their blood sugar before you administer any insulin to make sure that that everything is accurate, that you have the most accurate result at that time that you're getting ready to give that dose of insulin. Because there could be a lot of changes in their in their glucose levels in that two hour time span. So and some of your hospitals actually um, their policies are a little bit different. Cox, I think says within the hour you have to recheck it if it's been over an hour for mercy um, if it's been over 30 minutes even 31 or 32 minutes you have to recheck a blood sugar before you give them any doses of insulin okay so a hemoglobin a1c level will um, give us an overall blood sugar average for the um, past three months so hemoglobin A is sticky in hyperglycemia. So the test measures the amount of glycosylated hemoglobin in your blood. This test gives a good estimate of how well diabetes is being managed over time. Since it's attached to RBCs, it gives a picture of blood sugar status for the past 120 days. This can be drawn anytime. There's no special preparation is necessary and no need to fast. Of course, the higher your hemoglobin A1C value, the higher the risk that you will develop complications from diabetes. Those complications being eye disease, kidney disease, nerve damage, heart disease, and stroke. So for your hemoglobin A1C, normally only a small percentage of the hemoglobin mole molecules in red blood cells come become glycosylated, that is chemically linked to glucose. So the percentage of glycosylation increases over time and, if, and is higher if there is more glucose in your blood. Therefore, older red blood cells will have a greater percentage of glycosylated hemoglobin and diabetics whose blood glucose has been too high will have a greater percentage of that glycosylated hemoglobin. So our normal hemoglobin A1C um, values, um, four to five is um, what we see in non-diabetic patients. Six to seven, we're saying um, a pre-diabetic or in need of a moderate control. And if they're in that range from eight to 12, they're in need of active measures to lower their overall blood sugar. And you can see um, there eight to 12, is going to give you an average glucose of 
over 183 all the way up to about 298. That's a that's a three month average. And then the glucose tolerance test um, that's begun in a fasting state. So a fasting blood sugar and a urine is obtained. There's two ways to perform this. We can do a short test where 50 grams of glucose is given and they retest that um, glucose level in an hour. Greater than 140 suggests pre-diabetes and greater than 200 suggests diabetes. And then the long test, there's a standard amount of glucose given about 100 grams. The blood is drawn and the urine may be obtained then at one, two, and three hours. The urine here may be checked for ketones and it confirms ketones in the blood as well. So medical nutrition therapy for diabetes um, is the cornerstone of management. So decreased controlled ingestions of foods high in sugar and fat. Correct, we need to um, also correct or, or avoid obesity. So dietitians here may be involved. We need to make sure that our patients are controlling their diets, um, decreasing weight, we need to um, address this and the physicians or the diabetic educators will address this on an individual basis. The ADA supports and advocates the use of myplate.gov. Um, it's recommended that the term ADA, which is American Diabetes Association diet, no longer be used um, as they no longer endorse any single meal, meal plan or specified percentages of macronutrients. So they're advocating the use of myplate.gov. Um, so to maintain a weight, someone here should, someone should eat about 28 calories per kilogram of body weight um, and then to lose weight, they should eat about 15 to 20 calories per kilogram of body weight. So again, that's going to be addressed on an individual basis um, with the physician and the diabetic educators and probably a nutritionist as well. So diet orders such as no concentrated sweets, no sugar added, low sugar are also inappropriate here because they do not reflect the diabetes nutrition recommendations and they unnecessarily restrict sucrose. So medical nutrition therapy, um, consistent carbohydrate diabetes meal planning system. So we need to have consistent carbohydrates from meal to meal and day to day. That's going to give our patients the best control that they can possibly have. Um, the diet needs to be based on a heart healthy diet principle. So low saturated fat and cholesterol. Protein should be about 15 to 20% of their calories. And the majority of the carbohydrates should be whole grains, um, fruits, vegetables, and low-fat milk. About 45 to 60% of their meal plan is going to be made up of carbohydrates. And then we want less than 7% fat per meal. And their vegetables should also make up more than about a fourth of their meal. Okay, so we want to um, make sure that they know that they are using fats that are liquids at room temperature. They're taking in high fiber foods, avoiding alcohol, and avoiding gravies, sauces, and fried foods. So about fats here, trans fat is created when foods are cooked at high temperatures and treated with hydrogen. So this process is often referred to as hydrogenation and it gives foods a longer shelf life. So you'll know that a product has trans fat in it if it says partially or fully hydrogenated oil in the ingredient list. A high percentage of commercial baked goods and packaged foods fall into this category. So foods that contain saturated and trans fat both remain solid at room temperature and have a negative impact on our health. So according to the American Heart Association, 
Association, they elevate blood glucose levels, which increases the heart disease risk. So unsaturated fats, on the other hand, have very different characteristics. They remain liquid at room temperature and have two subgroups known as poly and monounsaturated fats. So most of these liquids derive from plant sources and include olive, canola, sunflower, soybean, sesame, and corn oil. And those are better for, um, for us and our diabetic patients as well. So carbohydrate consistent diet. We want to keep the uh, amount of carbohydrates consistent in every meal. So they should have two to three servings of 15 grams of carbohydrates per meal. So 15 grams of carbohydrates is going to equal what you may hear in the clinical setting as well as one carbohydrate serving. Um, so they may have two to three. Sometimes, um, sometimes our patients may even have anywhere from three to four. So they may um, be prescribed a diet that is 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrates per meal. We want to make sure um, that they're getting foods from three basic food groups, fats, proteins, and carbs. Um, carbohydrates are the foods that can be broken down into sugar that actually increase the blood glucose. So we want to make sure, or I'm sorry, most of the carbohydrates we eat come from these food groups, starch, fruit, milk, and sweets. So our diet is not always the best plan. So we want to make sure that our patients are getting educated in what are the best foods to pick from to include in their in their carbohydrate servings so our carbi carbohydrate consistent diet we want to choose nutrient rich carbohydrate foods um, often like whole grain products fruits vegetables and low fat dairy products we want to round out the rest of the meal plan with lean meat fish and poultry our patient teaching here should include sample menus with some of the patient's favorite foods added. Successful carbohydrate counting really depends a lot on the understanding of what foods are considered carbohydrates and how much is considered a serving and understanding how to read a label. So carbohydrates include starchy vegetables, fruits, bread, cereal, pasta, milk, and milk products. So if our patient is on insulin, we want to make sure that they're eating um, all of their food, that they're eating at regular times. So they're not really messing with their insulin and their, their meal regimen. We want to make sure that they don't skip meals, but if they're, um, have, if, if they have an illness or they're nauseated or, or vomiting, they want to follow some sick day guidelines. And those guidelines, we'll talk about them here in just a little bit, but those guidelines will be individualized as well and set by their physician. So they need to keep in close contact with their physician if they're ill and they can't keep anything down. So diabetic patients typically meet with a dietitian or a trained, um, trained professional. They're going to teach them the basics. Um, we don't want to overwhelm them. Um, if available, um, they may give them handouts or if we have handouts to give them too, we definitely can. We want to make sure that we're demonstrating and they're giving us repeat demonstrations so that way we can understand their understanding of the disease process and all the teaching that goes along with it because they will feel very, very overwhelmed. Um, some patients may even be in denial, especially those who are newly diagnosed. We want to assume that they know nothing, so we teach them everything. And we want to encourage that they're asking any questions, even if they think it's silly. We want to make sure that they're asking. Um, and we want to include their support systems in any teaching as well. So like I said, they will meet, um, especially your newly diagnosed, will meet with diabetic educators. They'll meet with physicians. Um, so they will be those first people that really set a regimen for these patients. And as a nurse, you're really going to encourage them to adhere to that regimen. And you can 
acknowledge if they have any problems. Um, if you think that they're not administering their insulin appropriately, then we need to talk to the proper people or we need to maybe give another demonstration to them. Or if you think that they don't understand how to read a label or how to count, count carbohydrates, we want to make sure and intervene and make sure that that they are getting the best understanding that they possibly can. Okay, so sick day protocol. Um, typically, their insulin is going to be taken as usual. Um, now, again, I would I would advise um, our patients to contact their physicians if they're unable to keep any fluids down, um, because they may want to make some adjustments to their insulin protocol for for that time period. If it's possible, we want to encourage our patients to drink liquids hourly. And then we want to have them do blood glucose checks every four to six hours and to make sure they're checking their urine for ketones. If nausea and vomiting, um, we want them to try 15 grams of carbohydrates an hour and report any blood sugars greater than 300 and any ketones in the urine. Okay, and here's just a list of some of those foods that contain 15 grams of carbs that you can um, encourage your patient to take if they can when they're ill. Okay, so exercise and diabetes. So we know working muscles require less insulin to move glucose into cells than resting muscles. And exercise lowers blood sugar levels. Sometimes that can be good. Sometimes that can be bad if they go into then a hypoglycemic state. Um, we want to make sure that our patients are following precautions for safe exercise. So exercise is a very effective addition to a treatment plan of people with diabetes. It aims in weight loss, improves their circulation, and also improves their insulin sensitivity. So exercise is almost like giving your body some insulin, even when it doesn't make its own. It helps that exogenous insulin work better. And ultimately, a good exercise regimen can lower the amount of insulin that a patient needs. Um, exercising muscles uses glucose 20 times the rate of muscles at rest. And exercise muscles do not require the insulin that resting muscles do. So diabetic patients should meet with their physician prior to setting um, exercise plans. They want to discuss alternating insulin or food intake prior to exercise. And if they have a serum glucose less than 100 and they're getting ready to exercise, they really should plan on a snack or a meal before that happens. And we want to also teach our patients to avoid exercise during the peak action of any insulin. Okay, so these patients need to have a complete medical examination before initiating a new, a new exercise program. We want to discuss whether or not to alter food and insulin intake before exercise. We do want to encourage exercise 30 to 60 minutes, three to four times a, a week. So tell our patients too to be sure to include a warm up and a cool down exercise and that um, they have comfortable, well-fitting shoes designed for that activity. They also need to wear a medical alert bracelet while they're exercising um, and carry food or glucose tablets in case hypoglycemia occurs. Okay, surgery considerations for diabetics. Patients here are typically off their routine um, and they're stressed, they're anxious, um, they may experience slow wound healing, um, so they have an increased risk for infection. They're taken off routine insulin and placed on a sliding scale with every four to six hour um, blood sugar checks here. So type twos are often even changed to injections while they're in the hospital and their oral hypoglycemics are typically held until close to the discharge date. Okay, so surgery considerations for diabetics, um, they're going to have IV fluids. We're going to need to decide when we're going to reintroduce the diet. We want to make sure that they have meticulous skin, skin care and they're, we're using extreme sterile techniques. We want to frequently assess the wound and continuously assess these patients for hypo or hyperglycemia. 
keep in mind that these patients just coming out of surgery um, have been under most of them general anesthesia, some of them just a conscious sedation, but they'll be less alert. And so they won't, um, po they possibly won't know that they're experiencing any signs or symptoms of low blood sugar. So we want to continuously assess them and monitor their sugars frequently. Okay, type two, um, taking oral agents. Some oral agents can be taken up to the day of surgery and some need to be stopped one to three days before surgery and use insulin to control their blood sugars. So these patients who only take oral medication to control their blood sugars may not understand or like it if all of a sudden they have to have those insulin injections. Um, so be sure to note to them that the medication was just stopped for surgery and the injections are given to control the, the sugars and promote better healing. So if the sugars are well controlled, um, most likely they should be back on their oral medications by discharge. Okay, insulin and oral hypoglycemic agents. So approach to treatment for type 1, this is aimed at glycemic control to reduce cardiovascular complications, tight blood glucose control accomplished by diet, um, self-monitoring of blood glucoses, exercise, and insulin replacement. Um, they'll have three or more insulin injections per day using short and intermediate acting insulin versus a continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. So we want to hear, watch for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia with intense insulin therapy. And why do you think the use of oral hypoglycemics for type 1 diabetic patients um, are not used? That, that is because they don't make insulin. Type 1s do not make insulin. Type 2s do make insulin, but they may not make enough or may, they may have an insulin resistance. So approach to treatment for type two, we want to intervene immediately at the time of the diagnosis. Treatment is aimed at glycemic control with diet and exercise and if needed drug therapy. We want to teach these patients self monitoring of blood glucoses, monitor their disease process using hemoglobin A1C. And we want to maintain that hemoglobin A1C of less than seven for these patients. Insulin is recommended for type 2 diabetes with weight loss, type 2 diabetics with weight loss issues on oral meds and with severe hyperglycemic symptoms. Okay, oral hypoglycemic agents. These are indicated for type 2 diabetics. Um, there's numerous different hypoglycemic agents. We have sulfonylureas, meglintonides, Big, big guanines, thiazolidinedionines, um, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, dipeptidol peptidase 4 inhibitors, sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors. These are all listed on page 1073 in your book. This list is a drug category. Listed in your book is what medications belong in what category. So for our patients here being prescribed sulfonylureas, be sure and check for sulfa allergies or any reactions to sulfonamides. Okay, these examples here, sulfonylureas are glipizide, gliburide, and glimepiride. The action here stimulates pancreatic secretion of insulin and increases sensitivity of insulin receptors. They're second generation drugs. They have fewer side effects and drug interactions. We're gonna of course check for allergies to sulfonamides and side effects here are gonna be hypoglycemia and weight gain. Okay, our examples here are gonna be Prandin and Starlix. Our action is to stimulate the release of insulin it's taken before meals. It prevents then that postprandial blood glucose elevation. And our side effects here are also hypoglycemia and weight gain. 
Okay, so this is otherwise known as metformin, um, which is what we hear more often in the clinical setting. It decreases glucose production by the liver and increases glucose uptake, uptake by the muscles. The side effects can be GI symptoms, decreased appetite, nausea, diarrhea, lactic acidosis, which is very rare. Um, our nursing considerations here, we wanna monitor serum creatinine and BUN levels prior to therapy. Um, it's metabolized through the kidneys, so it increases their risk for renal failure, especially if they already have increased serum creatinine and BUN levels. We want to hold metformin for 24 hours prior and 48 to 72 hours after any radiologic contrast media or surgery. Okay, your glitazones, they decrease insulin resistance and thereby increase glucose uptake by muscle and decrease glucose production by the liver. Side effects here are hypoglycemia, only in the presence of insulin, weight gain, edema, and mild transient anemia. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, they inhibit carbohydrate digestion and absorption, thereby decreasing the postprandial rise in blood glucose. Side effects can be GI symptoms, flatulence, cramps, abdominal distension, and stomach growling. Dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors. Examples here are Genuvia. <clears throat> Action it stimulates the release of insulin and inhibit hepatic glucose production. This should not be taken with insulin. Side effects here are stomach upset, diarrhea, headache. Adverse reactions include elevated liver enzymes and inflamed pancreas. The sodium glucose coast transporter 2 inhibitors, examples here are Invokana. The action, it reduces the reabsorption of glucose in the kidneys, increased urinary glucose excretion, and decreased plasma glucose levels and weight loss. Side effects are hypotension, hyperkalemia, UTIs, yeast infections, decreased urination, and increased risk for cardiovascular events and strokes. Amylin mimetics, otherwise known as Simlin. This is synthetic form of the hormone amylin. A synthetic amylin delays gastric emptying, suppresses glucagon secretion, acts on the brain to increase the sense of satiety and lower caloric intake. Our side effects here can be hypoglycemia in the presence of insulin and nausea. Nursing considerations, it can delay the absorption of PO drugs, so we need to give PO drugs one hour before or two hours after a simulin. In Cretin mimetics, otherwise known as Bieta, this can be used in patients taking sulfonylureas or metformin to achieve glucose control. So the synthetic glucagen, glucagon-like peptide. It slows gastric emptying, stimulates glucose-dependent release of insulin, prevents postprandial release of glucagon, and suppresses the appetite. Side effects here can be hypoglycemia in the presence of sulfonylureas and GI effects. It can also delay the absorption of PO drugs. So give PO drugs one hour before by ADA. Okay, so the role of insulin, it's synthesized in the pancreas by beta cells within the islets of Langerhans. Its release is stimulated by glucose levels, and an increase in glucose levels equals an increase in secretion of insulin. Insulin release may also be triggered by amino acids, fatty acids, and ketone bodies. Sympathetic nervous system also controls the release of insulin. Insulin stimulates the active transport of glucose into the cells. It promotes fatty acid synthesis and conversion of fatty acids into fat and enhances protein synthesis in tissues and stops the conversion of protein into glucose. So insulin regulates the use of body fuels. 
Without insulin, which is the key to the cells, glucose will stay in the bloodstream. So decrease in insulin equals a catabolic process, a breakdown of fats and proteins. So without insulin, fats and proteins are wasted. Um, it increases our triglycerides and lipoproteins. And then um, we have muscle wasting, which is protein wasting. Ketones um, then become present and then we have an acidotic state. So let's talk about insulin preparations. Our sources here, recombinant DNA technology. So all insulin manufactured in the US today is the recombinant DNA technology. Human insulin is identical to insulin made by the pancreas or human, human insulin analogs or modified forms of human insulin. Um, beef and pork pancreas, there's no longer, it's no longer used in the U.S. So the beef was discontinued in 1998 and the pork was discontinued in um, 2005. So be familiar with these. Um, these are your different types of rapid acting, short acting, intermediate acting and long acting insulins. Um, they're good to know the onset and the peak, especially when you're caring for patients, because you want to make sure that if you have a patient who you're giving, say, humalog insulin to, which the onset is going to be less than 15 minutes, that you don't want to give it at 7, but their meal doesn't come until 8. So just make sure that you're very familiar with the, the onset and the peaks and the duration of, of how long that they last. And then the Lantus and the Levomir are the only ones that have no peak time to them. So our insulin types, we have rapid acting um, Humalog. It's clear colored given sub Q. It's rapid acting analog of regular insulin. The onset is 15 to 30 minutes. It lasts three to six hours. And the unit 100 is the strength. So what does unit 100 mean? That means that there's 100 units per milliliter. So when administering any insulin, we want to make sure and read our labels correctly. So many insulin pens look alike, especially some of the intermediate and long acting insulin pens. The peak for Humalog is going to be 30 to 90 minutes. And be aware, too, that there can be different concentrations of some insulins. Um, Unit 100 is not the only concentration. There is also U500, which is 500 units per milliliter instead of 100. U100 is the most commonly used. U500 is typically only used in emergencies or for patients who are extremely insulin resistant um, if they have greater concentrations. We also want to make sure if you're giving a U100 concentration insulin that you're using a U100 insulin syringe. And the same with um, the U500. If you're given a U500 concentration, you want to make sure that you're using a U500 insulin syringe if you're drawing it up from a vial. Another rapid acting is Novolog. It's um, clear colored given subcutaneous rapid acting analog of human insulin. Onset is 10 to 20 minutes. It lasts three to five hours. It's the unit 100 strength, and we want to give this just five to 10 minutes before eating. This and the Humalog are the two types, too, that you will see if you have a patient with an insulin pump, a continuous pump. Those are the two types that those patients will use. They'll either be Humalog or Novolog. Another rapid acting is Epidra. This is clear, clear colored, given sub Q. Rapid acting synthetic analog of natural human insulin. Onset is 10 to 15 minutes, lasts three to five hours. Unit 100 strength, give 15 minutes before eating or 20 minutes after starting to eat. 
Okay, so short-acting um, regular insulin. It's unmodified human insulin. It's clear-colored. Roots are sub-Q, which is your most common. IM is an approved route, but rarely used. I honestly have never seen insulin given IM. Um, this is the only kind of insulin, too, that you will be seen giving given IV um, as far as like in your insulin drips. Um, there used to be an inhalation, too, that has been taken off the market. Onset here is 30 to 60 minutes. It lasts 6 to 10 hours. This one is available in U100 and U500 strengths. And we want to give this um, subcutaneous 30 minutes before eating. Our NPH insulin made by um, conjugating regular insulin and protamine. It's cloudy colored. It's given subcutaneously. Onset is one to two hours. It's an intermediate acting. It lasts about 18 to 24 hours and available in U100 strength. It's given twice daily at the same time each day. And of the longer acting insulin in current use, NPH insulin is the only one suitable for mixing with short acting insulin. So mixing insulin, the protocol for drawing them up is we want to draw up the clear first and then the cloudy. So we're gonna inject um, how our air into the cloudy first. So say if you're given 10 units of NPH, you wanna inject um, 10 units of air into the NPH first, and then say you're given two units of a, um, like a, like a Novolog or clear insulin, a, a fast acting, then you want to inject two units of air into that one, go ahead and draw up your clear, and then go ahead and draw up your units of the um, NPH or the cloudy. So you wanna do clear to partly cloudy when you're um, drawing up and mixing insulins like that. Okay, long acting insulin, we have Detamir or Levamir. It's um, clear, colorless, given subcutaneously. It has a slower onset than NPH. Um, it's a dose dependent duration, 12 to 24 hours, available in unit 100 strength. It's given twice daily at the same time each day or once daily at HS or the PM meal. Um, do not mix this with any other insulins. And then Glargine or Lantus, this is a long acting. It's clear and color, colorless given subcutaneously. Onsets in 70 minutes, there is no peak. It's dose dependent duration is 12 to 24 hours. It's available in unit 100 strength. This is given once daily at the same time each day or once daily at bedtime or with that PM meal. Do not mix or dilute with any other insulins. So insulin facts, um, most insulins used to be cloudy. Now all are clear except for your NPH. We wanna inspect vials prior to injection and discard if they look abnormal. Clear solutions may be long acting as well. And we want to educate, educate, educate our patients. Okay. Concentration here, we talked a little bit about this. Insulin is available in two concentrations in the United States. That's U100, which is 100 units per meal and per ml, or U500, 500 units per ml. So mixing insulin should only be done with insulins of proven compatibility. Only NPH insulin is appropriate to mix with short acting, acting insulins, your regular, your list pro, aspart, or glulacine. Draw up clear into the syringe first. And then you have commercially prepared insulins that are available like um, your 70-30s, your 50-50s, your mixes of 70-30s, those pre-mixed files are used to help reduce er errors associated with drawing up two vials. So the downside of that though is that you cannot adjust dosing of one insulin without adjusting your dosing of your long acting and your short acting.
Okay, insulin facts. Subcutaneous administration is indicated for all insulins. Like I said, I've not seen even the insulins that are approved for IM injections. I've not ever seen insulin given intramuscularly. Um, always double check your draw with another nurse. We want to roll the bottle to mix it, not to shake. Um, when mixing insulin, we want to draw the clear first. Make sure we're checking expiration dates and check for any settling or frosting. Um, if they look like they're not normal, then you want to get rid of them and um, get a new vial. Injection sites. So the abdomen absorbs faster with more even absorption. We want to rotate the sites to prevent lip lipodystrophy. So in injection devices, we need syringe and needles, pen injectors, or they have jet injectors. Subcutaneously, they have infusion pumps. So they have portable insulin pumps and implantable insulin pumps. And then, of course, intravenous infusions for those that are in need of that with critical high glucoses. Always, always, always report to the oncoming shift any insulin given on your shift. And remember to estimate the peak times and pinch the skin up when you're giving an injection. Okay, this is what a portable insulin pump looks like. It actually looks like a little pager. People may wear it on like their belts or in their pockets. Um, dosage instructions here are entered into the pump small computer and the appropriate amount of insulin is then injected into the body in a calculated controlled manner. So these patients actually um, manage these sites themselves and their dosage instructions are handled um, closely by their physician and then just put into that, that computer and they can adjust those over a 24 hour period where they're maybe getting for three hours getting a different dose than they are from, you know, say from midnight to 3 a.m. They may get 1.2 units continuously um, and then from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. they could get just one unit or whatever their doctor prescribes but it can be set for multiple different basal rates over a 24-hour period of time. This is more like um, like a diabetic patient wearing their pancreas on the outside of their body so they're getting continuous um, basal insulin throughout the day that helps manage their blood glucose levels and then they also when they have a meal will it's set um, to calculate like how many units they have for how many carbo carbohydrates they intake so the patients when they get done eating a meal will set in their pump how many carbohydrates they took in and then their pump will automatically show how many units they um, are to get of insulin and then they'll just activate it to um, set that and then the insulin will be automatically injected into their body or automatically um, bolused into their body. If you do have a patient that has an insulin pump and they have become unconscious um, with hypoglycemia, either have them show you if you've had time how to suspend that pump if something does come up or just take it take it off you can just disconnect it from their whole body just pull it out it's not going to hurt them um, but it can save a life okay insulin storage so unopened vials may be stored under refrigeration until needed they're good up to the expiration date vials should never be frozen Open vials are good at room temperature for up to one month. Mixed insulin is good for one month at room temperature and three months in refrigerator. Administration is um, to be at room temperature. Syringes are marked in units. And we want to remember to match the insulin concentration with the syringe calibration. So make sure if you're giving U100 that you're using a U100 um, syringe and the same for U500 if you're Giving U500, you want to make sure that you're using a U500 syringe. So we need to know that type 1 diabetics must have insulin because their body doesn't make it. Type 2 diabetics may require insulin. And all insulin has the same basic action, 
Um, what varies is the onset, the peak, and the duration. Facts versus myths. Rapid acting insulins are clear. That is true. Intermediate and acting insulins and insulin mixtures mixtures are a milky or cloudy cover. That's cloudy color. That is sometimes true. Insulin is measured in units. That is very true. Insulin is available in U100 or U500. That is also very true. U100 is the most common. It has 100 units of insulin in one milliliter of solution. You must inject U100 insulin with U100 syringes. Okay, so insulin teaching. Dosages may need to be adjusted for exercise, illness, stress, and surgery. That is done by the physician. So we wanna teach our patient never to adjust doses without medical supervision. So if they have trouble, they need to contact their physician to um, make those adjustments for them. When teaching, we need to be matter of fact. We need to ask for repeat demonstrations so that way we know that our patient is understanding and can um, care for themselves when they leave the hospital. We wanna watch for pro problems with self-administration and go slow at the individual's pace you may have to demonstrate or go over things many, many times, and that's okay. Just make sure that they have a really good um, understanding before they leave the hospital. Complications of insulin are hypoglycemia, which we talked about earlier, the Samoji effect, the DOM phenomenon in tissue dystrophy. Let's start with the Samoji effect. This is a rebound hyperglycemia in the morning a swing to a high level of glucose in the blood from an extremely low level. So this usually occurs after an untreated insulin reaction during the night. So what happens is hypoglycemia stimulates glucose counter regulation, and then the body stress response, and then epinephrine growth hormones, glucagon is released, which stimulates gluconeogenesis in the body, which then constitutes a hyperglycemic moment in the morning. So patients here will often complain of awakening with a headache and report restless sleep, nightmares, maybe enuresis and nausea and vomiting. So the for the Samoji effect, people who experience high levels of blood glucose in the morning may need to actually test their glucose levels in the middle of the night. We're talking at like two or three in the morning because what may be happening is that maybe they're having a hypoglycemic episode that the body is actually responding to and then increases the blood sugar and they don't know it. So in order to remedy that, we they may need adjustments in the evening snacks or insulin doses. Um, may, those adjustments may be recommended as well. So those um, evening snacks will help keep from them going low in the middle of the night and then hopefully they'll have a more stable glucose level through the night and in the morning as well, and they won't have those hyperglycemic effects. Now let's move on to the dawn phenomenon. This is an early rise in blood glucose in the morning with no hypoglycemia during the night. This is actually managed by altering the time and dosage of insulin, but we want to be careful here not to cause then the Samoji effect where they have a low blood sugar in the middle of the night. And then tissue dystrophy. This is damage to tissues, causes impaired insulin absorption. Hypertrophy is when the skin thickens. Atrophy is when the skin shows dimpling. So the prevention here is to rotate our injection site. So there's a chart and I'll show you on the next slide. Um, in the hospital, if you have diabetic patients that you're giving insulin injections to, you want to make sure that you're actually using the sites that they really can't use when they're at home. So that way we can hopefully decrease their risk of tissue dystrophy. And this is just a, a figure of um, those many, many insulin injection sites that, that you can use or that our patients could even use if they're reachable for them. 
just a little funny. I don't think that's what they mean by rotating injection sites. So not rotating rooms that they're giving injections in, but actually rotating sites on their skin. So complications of insulin, erratic insulin action, could be dietary non-compliance. Um, maybe the patients are eating too much or not enough or errors or non-compliance with techniques. So we want to be sure that we're assessing our patients as well for any visual disabilities, um, their failure to rotate sites if they're actually given their own insulin, um, inadequate mixing, do they have frozen or outdated insulin, improper or self-adjusting, which can get them into trouble really quickly. So they need to be set up with a physician and make sure that they're contacting that physician for any assistance in adjusting their doses. Um, the use of drugs that may interfere with their insulin and irregular exercise. Slides are just some critical thinking. Um, that does it for the rest of the diabetes lecture. I will get this saved and uploaded, and as always, if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know.